Um, so I'll pick up where I left off before. I had decided, okay, I'm going to write down some stories and write this book, and then I decided to turn the sort, turn to the source of these stories, and ask them to contribute ideas and stories. And some of these with pitch were interviews. Others, like Catherine Barr, just wrote down bits that I included. But um, with with the stories that came in, they did come. They fell all over the map. So some of it was how to come up with an idea for a business. What are I, what are my decisions facing on lawyers and recruiting advisors and recruiting board members? We actually talk about that. How to manage your board, Series A, seed funding before that, different ideas to go through Series A, B, later stage complex situations, and then um, get into building value and M and A ultimately. And then I talk about the evolution of the secondary market too. But I think we've got a very sophisticated audience here. Most of you are clients of Silicon Valley Bank, so. Um, I'm going to talk about not the obvious stuff, but a couple of almost controversial ideas that will maybe spark some interesting conversation. So the first one, um, Tim Draper opens up in the book, and then um, who's the son of Pitch's first business partner. But um, there's a story from Branch Out. So Rick Marini um, tells his story in the book about how he raised a Series A. And the reason I included it was what he did was once he had the VC you know, investment locked in, he brought in angel investors afterwards. So Rick had, Rick, and that's something that maybe you guys might be able to do yourselves and it'll add value to the launch of your business. So what Rick, Rick had found at Tickle.com, which he sold for over $100 million to Monster.com. And so when he came out with the idea for Branch Out, there was a lot of interest. Branch Out was basically, you know, LinkedIn on Facebook. So let me see which one of my Facebook friends might be relevant to me in business and it would spread you know, virally. He pitched Mike Maples at Floodgate just for, as a friend for advice, and Mike responded saying, I'm in for a million. And before he knew it, he had Ken from Excel, who's the same board member who led the investment into Facebook and, and Groupon, um, give him a term sheet. So basically, he was done. His Series A was basically done. He had Norwest and Excel, his choice of VCs in there. What he did, which is relevant to you, hopefully, is that when the VC round was done, he went out and asked a couple of friends that he knew and some kind of angel dignitaries that he didn't really know. Um, my VC round is done. Here's what we're doing. I'm opening this up to 20 angel investors to put 25K each into my company on the same terms as the Series A. And the result was that he got 20, you know, like the founder of AngelList, you know, Sean Parker, just huge names put in 25K, which they could afford to lose. It wasn't a problem for them. And they have, you know, somewhat more bandwidth than some of these guys um, to add value. And every one of them was a whale on Facebook and a whale on Twitter, meaning they have, you know, million follow followers type people. And so when he launched Branch Out, he had more support than just two venture capital firms that are on, you know, 15 boards going to eight meetings a year. Um, he had this huge power base to take off. Um, so that's something that you might, you might be able to use, and it could be your Series A, it could be your Series B. Um, and someone like me might be excited about putting 25K in your business if I see you know, Sequoia and Lightspeed you know, investing in it. And it's not just an idea. Um, I did this with Georgetown Angels about three weeks ago with Backplane. Backplane, if you haven't heard about it, is one of the hotter companies on the West Coast. They're now on the East Coast too, um, where the company, you know, got certainly closed their, their VC funding and then, and then my group got to invest. But Eric Schmidt was the first, the lead angel investor, so former CEO of Google, executive chairman of Google, Eric Schmidt, then he had Peter Thiel invest, then he had Joe Lonsdale, the founder of Palantir invest, and Joe Lonsdale from Palantir became the chair, is, is the chairman and is listed as a co-founder of this business, and then he had Founders Fund, um, Sequoia, at, um, Battery, Menlo, Google Ventures, Tomorrow Ventures, huge list of um, VCs. Then he opened it up to us, and then, we, and then I invited 10 of my friends to group up, and Georgetown Angels made an investment into that company at the same terms as the VCs. And what'll happen is we're getting together in a week or two with those that invested as angels, with the CEO, and we're gonna see is there anything we can do to help? You know, and the, another, a key, a key message here is that the network around your company is your company. So the advisors that you bring on early on um, you know, are the ones that are the super connectors. Like Peter Mullen knows probably everybody I know in the state of California. 
you know, if you can get a guy like this to take an interest in your company, it might be worth, you know, figuring that out. Um, so it's just another tactic on, you know, a way to do that. You know, a very different story um, is, um, comes from Antoine Papernik. Antoine is a general partner at Sophie Nova Ventures, Sophie Nova Partners in France. And Sophie Nova, it, for Antoine, he, you know, lightning struck twice for him, he, um, or more than that, but he's, he was the lead VC investor in the biggest medical device exit in history. And then he invested in another medical device company, which is the second biggest medical device exit in history. About 70% of his money is invested in US companies, even though he's in Paris. And he talks about um, carve-outs. And carve-outs can be a controversial you know, discussion point with some VCs, but I lived it up close and personal. I raised a lot of venture capital funding, almost $100 million. We didn't get it all, we had, we had 47 million in, and then I had offers to sell the company when the IPO got pulled for less than the amount of money I owed back to the VCs. So like, my credit card bill with the venture world was bigger than buyers would buy my business for. And, and this happens in capital intensive businesses. When you have, you know, it's not uncommon for a company to raise 150 million, 250 million. These 600 million plus VC funds like that. It starts to move the, move the money. They get management fees and carry. So when, what inevitably happens is that a company that's raised 250 million, if it has a one-time liquidation preference, the liquidation preference means that when they sell the company, when they liquidate it, um, there's a preference to the preferred shareholders. They have to pay that money back to the VC. And in modern times and in civilized times, the liquidation preference is 1x. Sometimes it's worth negotiating it to be more, depending on your you know, different view of the value of the exit. But um, if the company has to pay $250 million back to the VCs before the CEO, the founders, and the common shareholders will see any money, and an offer comes in to buy the company for $200 million, the CEO is going to say, well, I'm not going to do it because I'll sell the company for $200 million, all the money goes to the VCs, and I get nothing. Um, and my, my fellow founders and, share, you know, and common early employees get nothing. So what Antoine has learned is let's put in place a management incentive, an incentive for management to tell me, the VC, that there was an offer to sell the company in 200. Otherwise, he doesn't even know about it. So, you know, legal lawyers will call it a management incentive plan. You know, we call it a carve out, where we say, okay, if the company gets sold for over a certain amount, like 50 million, we're gonna carve out five or 10% of that, and it'll go to the common shareholders, you know, which typically means the CEO and the founders and the senior management and the employee option pool. And that way, when the CEO gets an offer to sell the company for 200 million, he's gonna say, you know, that 10% of that's 20 million. Um, I could get the hell out of this place. I've been here for nine years, and I have this growing credit card debt with venture capitalists. I'll at least tell my VC about it. And the VC can always block it. Most VCs have blocking rights on a change of control or you know, selling of the company. So at least Antoine knows when there's an opportunity to sell. And for him, getting some money back might move the needle in the right direction, put some points on the board ahead of the next fundraise for the next fund. It's not a bad idea. So I argue for carve outs in pretty much every case. There's ways of structuring them with young guys and early companies that until it gets to a certain point, there is no carve out. But that's one point. You know, Antoine also talks about how liquidation preferences play out in, in the real world. When sometimes in, you know, if you're a Silicon Valley guy and there's all these VCs around, you might end up with five, six, seven, eight different venture firms on your board or at least in your cap table investing in your company. And it becomes harder and harder for the board or the CEO to make and execute on a decision of another financing round, a key, a key, a key um, staffing issue or a sale of the company. And the CEO needs to get a subset of the board and lead from there and then just drive things. And one example of how to find out which of your VCs are serious about continuing to support the company and invest in the next round is to send out an email, again with the support of a subset of the board at least, that the next financing round is gonna have a 20 times liquidation preference. So that doesn't mean they get paid back once, they get paid back 20x. And it's almost like when you hear someone getting five lifetime prison sentences. The guy's not getting out of prison. If you, if you invested in that company before and you don't pay to play in the next round, you're gonna get washed out to zero. All the founders down to zero. 
And this is sometimes VCs behaving badly, but it's also a way of at least getting, ah, now he's returning my phone call and my email. And uh, you're gonna find out which VCs are keen to continue to support your company. If you do a pay to play like that, and you implement a 20x liquidation preference and wipe out all the founders and previous investors, you can attempt to be ethical and issue warrants or stock options and create an options pool. Then when you do it, you would always do that. You'd say 20x liquidation preference, and oh, by the way, we have a new option pool where we're gonna you know, retain new talent and attract new talent. And you could reward some guys that have been good supporters, but have moved on and maybe payroll ran out and they left a few years ago, but they're good guys. So that, you know, that's another one. Another one that, this is one of my own models I put into uh, the book is Michael Porter, you may know the five forces model where you know, they look at competitors, you know, customers, substitutes, suppliers, things like that too. It's like a McKinsey exercise really to understand you know, a decision to make. You know, this is what I think whiteboards are for. I, I make a box, you know, I call it the Romans five forces model, but it's really Michael Porter for venture capital. I just make a square or circle in the middle and I write the name of the company. And then, you know, you could say like, it's not just the company, it's the, the decision. What are we doing? Are we raising more? Are we selling? Are we gonna pivot? Are we gonna just, you know, you know, just tighten our belts and keep going? And so that's the company in the middle. And then I'd say like the current CEO, put a circle above him with an arrow down to the company. Now, is that a hired CEO or is that a founding CEO? Uh, you know, on the other side, I'd put the, the founders, each one in a separate box. Are they still with the company? Is that a founder who's no longer in the company? What kind of power do they have at the board level? And how do they think of this next round? Are they gonna get diluted by raising more money? And will that push out the exit yet more years? The new CEO might say, I want to IPO, I'm like Steve Jobs, I'm not gonna flip an Instagram, I want my grandkids working at this company. Where those founders might be saying, come on man, I want to see my 20 million and get on with it. Um, then I map out the incumbent VCs, the VCs that are already in this deal. And it's key to understand where are each of these VCs in their own life cycle. Did they just close that 675 million in July? So that means that they're sitting on a mountain of dry powder to invest into companies, which means that it may be that that guy does not want to invest. He's got, he's in his commitment period, so he's got five years to invest in new opportunities. And maybe he looks at this one as saying, I'm not gonna put good money after bad. And, and then another VC, that's an incumbent VC, who's already in the deal, may be saying, well, you know, I can't invest in new companies. All my money is in reserve for the existing portfolio. I'm in year seven. And in fact, I wanna push some money into this company because I don't wanna pay a clawback on the management fee that I've been spending. Silicon Valley Bank gave me a mortgage on my management fees, and, and I have to pay them back if I don't use the fund. So you might have one existing VC saying to the CEO, hey man, we should take this thing up a notch and raise $80 million and hit strong. We're getting outfunded by the competition. And the other VC, like Gravity Underwater, is just doing what's in his interest. Not a bad guy, just can't help it. He's like, let's sell the company now. Let's just call it a good day. We're all making a lot of money. We invested at a five million pre, let's sell it 100 million. So the CEO is getting a conflicting story from everybody, from the founders, from the new CEO, from these guys. And of course the new VCs coming in, they're easier to understand. They want the lowest valuation they can get without losing the deal, right? But at least map it out. So I say to people, map it out. This is nothing you don't know. You're driving in your car thinking about it. But when you formalize it, you can get on the phone with each one of these parties and openly say, what are your interests on this? It's kind of like getting to yes. What is the interest of the other people involved in this negotiation? Certainly some CEOs can get caught in this little you know, tornado and lose sight and just go with the, the, the guy that they're having drinks and a cigar with and get sucked down into the path of what was right for one party. You know? But um, last thing I'll talk about, and I really do want to try this beer, is um, the evolution of the secondary market. And this is something that is still controversial. It's less controversial on the West Coast than when I'm in New York. I, I hear people really f still freaking out about it. But in the past, in ancient times, like when I was a venture back CEO, I could not sell my stock before the definitive liquidity event for the company. So that means that, you know, if you know, we were on the IPO path. And I remember these, I was young, not as smart or you know, tough as Zuckerberg. I just got pushed around. They said, okay, you're gonna sign this lockup period. So this Morgan Stanley is my bank for the IPO. You're gonna sign this lockup period, you're gonna be locked up for 18 months. So after the IPO, even though you were the first person in this company, we're all gonna sell before you. 
And they've just arrived, and so I thought that was ridiculous. And I said, I, I don't want to sign that. And everyone said, if you don't sign it, there'll be no IPO. So I said, I complied and went along with that. But it, if I could have sold something during the first 18 months, I would have. And I think it's not considered bad for people to sell after the lockup of 18 months. Well, the market has changed. There's been a transformational culture shift where there are investors that, you know, unlike some of the comments here, their strategy is to put money in within a one to three year window of the exit. So they want to buy shares in a big company that's going straight up where they think, you know, I could have invested in Twitter at, you know, 11 billion dollar valuation literally just a few weeks ago, and now it's maybe at 18 or something. So there are people who, their funds, that want to move big amounts of money. They're getting money from the big pools at $25 million checks for their, you know, you know, billion dollar fund, and they want to buy some Dropbox and some Box and some Foursquare and these big, big deals. It's coming down to the smaller companies too. So if you've got a company with a valuation where 20% of your position is worth $5 million, you can sell your shares even though you're a privately held company, if you're venture-backed and it's a good story. And I'm, I'm someone you can call about doing that. So that's, this is an evolution in the market. The reason people didn't sell stock in their privately held company in the past was because they couldn't. Now, some people will say this is a huge negative signal. If Bill Gates is selling stock in Microsoft, he knows more than the public, we should all dump our Microsoft stock. That's an argument people have said in the past. I just think it's ridiculous. That's as ridiculous as saying after the lockup, you still should not sell any stock. You know, the last thing is, um, that makes it so obvious is that imagine that you take $200 into Las Vegas and you, you start, you're playing poker or blackjack and you lift that up to $10,000. So you're up to $10,000 from your original 200. The old school VC would say, son, I want you to put all your money in on your next hand. Just bet it all because I get a little bit if this is a big hit. And you know, and it's, it, for that VC, he's probably got diversify, diversified across 15 companies in the one fund, probably diversified across vintage of raising a fund, stacking fees every three years. It's easy for him to say that. But I think if you're a founder, I believe selling 20% of your position with each financing round should be a new normal if you want that liquidity. And you can take that money and diversify it into other things like angel investments that are not gonna wait for your IPO and your lockup. And I think that for an angel investor like me, if I put in with my group a million dollars into Backplane and it goes up, you know, and it gets to a $250 million valuation, you know, it might make sense for me to divest a little bit of that, return a million dollars to my friends, and we've got a zero cost investment, and with that million dollars, and just the people that we know that work at that company, we're gonna get access to some amazing angel deals and be able to start putting money into those with money that we liquefied out of a privately held company. So it makes sense, it makes sense for founders to diversify themselves into some cash, to have some money to put into other deals that are in their network, and it makes the whole ecosystem move faster. You know, um, you know if I had gotten a carve out you know, of 50 million, that would have been 5 million, I would have been investing, I would have spawned ecosystems, you know, back in the early 2000s of my own company. You, go ahead. Yeah, um, sounds really reasonable from the founder's perspective. Is it the problem that the VC doesn't think like that? They want you to have a lot of pain if you, uh, if you really think that way. So this is where it's still controversial. There are some VCs who are saying to you, you know, like even in Europe, Jorg Rubala from Wellington Partners told me this years ago. He said, as a general partner investing in, you know, entrepreneurs like you, he found that when an offer came, came along to sell the company, the entrepreneur who had all of his eggs in one basket was saying, I think we should take it. You know, I mean, 50 million, call it a good day, I'll buy a ski house and I'm set, and I have another, a new startup I want to do. And, but that didn't move the needle on his big fund for Wellington. So there was a conflict of interest. So he started encouraging his own CEOs to take 250K or 500K euros out of the next financing round. So some VCs are encouraging it and they're saying, let's do a secondary. So, you know, you have, um, you know, Wonga. We're talking about Wonga, which is like a big data company that lends you money like through the website immediately. And the Brits love a little borrowing money before payday. So I know Errol pretty well. Errol agreed to join the Founders Club and then um, he closed his B round with, um, I think it was Balderton, 
which is like benchmark Europe, and um, it was a 15 million euro round, and they put an extra two and a half million euros to buy some of his private stock. So like 17 and a half million euros gets injected, gets, gets invested, two and a half goes out the door just to Errol's pocket. And then he gets diluted a little bit more, and the rest goes to fuel, you know, growth for the company. So there are some VCs that are keen to align interests with their management team to hold out for the optimal exit, and also to reward, you know, some progress. And there are other, you know, I think that the VCs are less afraid of it than the entrepreneurs. You know, from what I see, I think the entrepreneurs are worried about sending a negative signal. And you know they should just discuss it and find out what is the cultural perspective of their investors, you know, on doing it. Um, I think until you get a pretty good valuation, you know, don't really bother with it. You know, from my perspective, minimum deal size on a secondary is really five million, unless it's just to get a deal done at a million and then we think we can do more, you know, as valuations go up. But for investors, for some investors, if you're investing at a $5 million valuation on, as a cap on a convertible note, and you sell the company to Facebook for 50 million, you know, you're making a 10x return. If the company starts having a pre-money, and that would be considered good, if the company gets to a pre-money of 100 million and it's raising more, you might wanna sell some of your stock even as an angel. And to keep it simple, to sell it to the existing VCs. You know, keep it simple. If, it, if the numbers get bigger, there start to be other investors that wanna get in, and it can be good for the company too. If you get Fidelity, Fidelity is now realizing that the bump after an IPO is not so huge. They want to invest in a startup before the IPO, when it's still private, get to see what's going on, get some inside information. And when the IPO comes around, they know more than the banker. You know, so they, and then, and then for the company, they're migrating their shareholder base from like a Ron Conway or a Georgetown Angels um, to guys that can take a big bite out of the IPO and, and show institutional support for that. So you know, with that, I'd say you know, let's let's get into networking. Uh, we had a late start, and that was fun. I think um, you know, the book to me has been a bit of like uh, a microcosm of Silicon Valley, with people just contributing and helping. I think uh, what makes you know Silicon Valley great and global Silicon Valley culture great is people helping each other without asking for anything in return, and that's you know what turns water to wine and the magic dust of these startups like uh, you know Rick Marini taking off so fast. So thank you very much for coming in. Carrie, thank you.